Thank you very much. And thank you very much for everyone for being here today. And what I want to share with you today is one question which really drives my academic life, my professional life. And it is how future cities will look like and how robotics can help in that. How robotic ecosystem will work together to improve our quality of life, to improve and give value to us as human beings in those cities. So I think um, future cities will consist of autonomous cars, autonomous buildings, autonomous agents, and all of them working together. Now before I dive into that, let me just connect to Blancpain and uh, my growing up in Switzerland. So I grew up in Switzerland, I used to like watches a lot. I used to like to take them apart a lot, actually. I had this like, table full of dead watches. And one of the things I also liked was to um, build like, small explosive devices, you know, <laughs> using self-made explosives, which then once I did this experiment in front of the window, so I de developed one device, I was 10 years old, and then it exploded, it worked excellently, it was beautiful. It just broke the window, which was a bit, um, and my mother was quite unhappy. Still, 20 years later, I went then to Harvard and I developed still the same idea of working on explosives, but this time for applications in robotics. And that worked quite well as well. We developed a small robotic insect using explosive, which uh, later also won an award at the conference. So my mother was quite pleased. So never underestimate the childhood um, curiosity. And in robotics, and especially in drones, uh, today there is an age of curiosity and there is an ecosystem that is being built. So drones started in military and several years ago they got a bit this flavor, but now they move into a lot of different applications from agriculture to media, filming, industrial inspection, even consumer drones, uh, toy drones and so on. The question, however, is how will drones look like in 20 years? So when your child now plays with drones, what will this child develop in 20 years when uh, he or she goes into her or his uh, careers? And I think one thing we need to realize here, which is that the, robot, the planet today already is robotic. Robotics already is taking over the planet and we are already interconnected and robotics already is happening around us. It's not something that is science fiction anymore. We probably came here with an autonomous vehicle, might it be a subway, might it be an autonomously driving car, and there are many other things like that too. One particular trend which is important is that we have a large urbanization trend. So we'll have about one billion people moving into the city over the next a uh, few years, of the next 20 years. So all these people need to be connected, they need to be interlinked, and robotics has a major role to play. The question is, again here, how to make this human-centric, how to make the human as the actor and have the technologies relevant and ethical acting together. So what I want to share with you today is about how this can help in material flows, in um, information flows, and in architecture, how robotics can enable these three key aspects of a future smart city. Now, if you think of material flows, uh, there are different aspects in the city, and there are several materials that need to flow. Of course, it's about transport, it's about uh, moving people around, also utilities, uh, cargo, logistics, waste, and all this needs to be enabled through robotic systems, potentially as well. But if you look at what it is, it includes um, a lot of different types of materials, and a lot of material. So in London alone, it is 360 tons of material that needs to move um, through the city. However, if you look at the um, packages that, del that, are get that are being delivered by, for example, Amazon, we see that only about two kilograms, um, that, uh, that most of them are only about two kilograms or less in weight. So they're mostly very small packages that need to be delivered to many different places. So the question then is, is it the best solution to have a truck going from one place to the next and carrying all these small packages? Or is there a potential to look at a um, flexible, parallelized logistic system where small autonomous agents can deliver those packages in parallel, potentially much faster, at much lower cost, but also with a much lower carbon footprint? And so this is really the potential of how drone delivery can um, bring value to this sector. So I guess you have seen that there is a lot of drone delivery attempts already being made with Amazon or um, Metternet or Zipline. And one particular one that I think has a lot of um, potential is to look at delivery networks in rural, Af rural Africa, for example, in Rwanda or in areas where the road infrastructure might not be as developed. 
and there it can bring a lot of value to deliver blood samples between hospitals or um, between <coughs> vaccines, for example, or things that need to be delivered very quickly and that often perish on the way of the delivery. And this is one initiative called the Red Line Project, which is doing that in Rwanda at the moment. So I think there's a lot of potential on logistics systems using drones. But of course, logistics needs the intelligence, it needs the information, it needs the data, and these two need to be combined to come up with a fully immersed logistics system that brings the value that it, uh, that it uh, promises. And so if you think of information then, it's not only about uh, knowing where it needs to go, but it also needs to know what happens on the route. It needs to know about the traffic, of course, but also uh, it could benefit from knowing about the energy management, energy consumption of the city, of where different um, energy losses occur in the city. But even if there is an emergency, even it could know of where the roadblocks are and how um, the rescue teams could be deployed in those areas. So drones in that sense have a much larger potential of not just doing logistics, but also doing energy management, also doing search and rescue, also doing, doing traffic monitoring, management, and so on. So a, large, a much larger um, view on information in cities. So the question, however, then again is how do you sense? And talking about the Internet of Things, the idea often is, is to create a lot of small sensors that are deployed across the city and collect a lot of data which then is interpreted using an artificial intelligence system or some other method to then extract what is important about it. But what if the data that it collects is collected in an intelligent way? What if the data sensors move through the city and have a curiosity to then go to places where something occurs? And then that the data is not just big but also relevant in the first place which then might help the development of more um, efficient extraction of information from this data. And so one um, scientific challenge that we have there is to look at ways how to do perching and collect this data. We look at spiders how to do that because they do these amazing nets to build structures in unknown environments and we can copy some of those principles to build robots that deploy the same ideas. So here what you see is, is a hard to access area, an oil platform or a high rise building and the robot that goes there and deploys a support scaffold, which then a second robot uses to attach to and inspect the infrastructure, look at environment, safe energy, be wind robust, so even if it's windy, it can anchor itself and let this be suspended in the environment. What is important, however, is that we do look <coughs> at nature in a conceptual way and look at what we copy from nature. So, for example, there are many eagles that do perching, but they do it very differently from flies. And if you want to build a system that is very small scale, we might better benefit from the approach that flies take. So we cannot just copy blindly, we have to copy and analyze and understand the functional uh, ways how the animals do that and copy those functional principles to the robots. So we then come up with something like this, which are small palm-sized robots that can fly together and weave networks of structures in those environments. And this is done completely autonomously by the having several systems moving together and working together. <coughs> Another challenge that I would like to share with you today is how to do autonomous water sampling. So imagine you have an oil spill response scenario or a flood and you want to send the robot there to fly, dive into the water, take a sample and bring that back very <laughs> effectively. So this uh, we developed, we call them aquatic micro -air vehicles or aquamaps which fly and do exactly that and we have shown this in outdoor terrains doing this diving by folding the wings and then using a water jet thrusters to fly back and return to the base station. So similar to diving birds, um, they do these motions, but really, really need to, again, understand the principles of how the birds do that. We need to then develop the hardware, software, and testing environments to implement that using the best of engineering knowledge that we have. So we don't copy blindly, we copy only the principles. Now for the last few minutes, uh, what I want to share with you is one more idea or one more vision and project that we have which looks at ways how robots can interact and maintain uh, infrastructure or the built environment in a city. So if you think of the built environment, there is of course the need to one, uh, inspect that, but also to repair it and also to potentially construct in a completely autonomous manner. So if we 
Think then of the idea to have an autonomous manufacturing system of buildings using swarms of flying vehicles. We can think of aerial 3D printers. And I think we'll have a session later today on 3D printing, which has definitely completely revolutionized the manufacturing industry. And the same thing is now happening in the construction industry and we see big 3D printers building buildings. The vision that we have here, however, is to look at ways how those robots, how flying robots could do the same, how swarms of scalable collective systems could do the same using biological stigmergic principles. This could then lead to new uh, building geometries and also reduce the materials uses and also reduce like that the carbon footprint of those future buildings. So the question of course then is how to do that and <laughs> that's quite of a challenge and uh, some one video that we did a few years ago that shows a bit uh, that aspect is this where you see um, a robot flying stabilizing itself and then depositing polyurethane foam from its tip to um, build layers that are then build, being built to build up larger structures. So of course, the control system here, although it is very good, it's one of the best that there is, it's still not good enough to build very precisely the layers. So then, therefore, we developed different ways how to stabilize the systems using a delta R manipulator tip that would then stabilize and deposit materials at millimeter accuracy. So as you see here, so it can fly, the platform itself might be influenced by turbulence, by control system errors, by sensor drift, by human operations or interaction with the environment, but still the tip can remain very stable and print very precisely. And this is something that we are doing at the moment. So the, then the larger vision, and this is in a research council funded project, is to create those swarms of robots that would build rescue shelters in disaster zones, for example, or do different tasks of this kind. Now, although this sounds probably like science fiction to many of you, it's not so far away. We aim at first demonstrators over the next years, but already now we have low-hanging fruits or close-term uh, applications which are uh, relevant and have a lot of industrial impact. For example, we can look at ways how we use the same principles to do pipeline repair. So we have a oil, uh, gas pipeline, let's say, that has a leak and there's a gas really being released through the leak. We can then send a drone there to re, you know, deposit material on the leak to then seal the leak very effectively. So we've shown this here, you see a video of how you can fly there, then uses the delta arm to precisely deposit um, the material on this leak. So this is something that we showed during the Drones for Good competition in, the, in Dubai last year. Also we were fortunate to win the first prize uh, with this application. So this is possible today, we are not so far away. Already today we can have these autonomous robotic workers that are being sent there to do different repair and intervention tasks. Now, how can we make this a reality? What is needed to do that? Of course we need you know, the research, we need the industry being engaged, but also we need everyone to chip in on that and support that. One thing to recognize, however, is that the UAVs today, the small companies and startups, are the Airbuses and their BA systems and so on from tomorrow. So now is the time where all this, where this industry is being born. And the growth rate, of course, is accordingly. They're usually good in areas where the people that you would send there look something like that, which usually you don't want because it's expensive, takes time, takes training, it's risky and uh, delicate. And also in areas um, where there is danger or unknown environments where the drones could be, go, could go, could be deployed and do different sensing tasks, information gathering tasks to then direct the rescue teams more effectively. The last application could also be on <coughs> a sustainable urban <coughs> ecosystems where drones would detect different parameters in the forest, for example, to um, you know, inform ecological models and like this, study climate change, reduce climate impact of different global initiatives. And this is something that we also do at the moment. So then my prediction, the bold prediction for the future is that these robots or different types of robots will be living alongside us in the future cities, alongside animals, alongside nature, alongside buildings and cars and they will be disappearing. So you will not know that they are robots. You will think, oh, it's another robot, iRobot, RoboBird, however they will be called. And I think this is something that we need to be aware of and also emotionally accept, that this might be a future that we are around, surrounded by robots, 
um, but are then creating this robotic planet that is supporting us to create this human planet that we want. Thank you.